This year, this election year, the Supreme Court will decide whether Obamacare is constitutional or not. Will the court help re-elect President Obama? Here today, constitutional scholars Richard Epstein and John Yoo. They'll talk about Obamacare and they'll talk dirty politics. Uncommon Knowledge, now. Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. By the way, please visit us on our website, hoover.org slash UK. Joining me, two of the nation's leading constitutional scholars, a professor at the New York University School of Law and a fellow at the Hoover Institution. Richard Epstein is the author, most recently, the author of a cascade of books and articles, but most recently, Design for Liberty, Private Property, Public Administration, and the Rule of Law a professor at the law school at the University of California at Berkeley and a former member of the Justice Department during the administration of George W. Bush. John Yu's most recent book is Confronting Terror, 9-11 and the Future of American National Security. Richard and John, welcome. It's great to be here. Thanks. Uh, in a word, and, and this, for this very first question, just one word, will the court help to reelect President Obama, John? Oh, that's great. Yes. Richard? Well, probably. <laughs> that was two. That was two. Okay. Yeah, but for Richard, that's miraculous in itself. <laughs> Segment one, the Supreme Court and the individual mandate. Passed in the House and Senate without a single Republican vote and signed into law by President Barack Obama on March 23, 2010, the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, universally known as Obamacare, raises a couple of constitutional issues. Issue one the issue we'll talk about first, the constitutionality of the, of the individual mandate. May the federal government force individuals to purchase health insurance? John, what should the plaintiffs argue? Plaintiffs should essentially say the federal government doesn't have power under the Constitution to compel people to enter the marketplace. Until this point in constitutional history, what would happen is that the market would produce a product, a good or service. People would voluntarily enter the market to sell goods or buy them. Once they're in that interstate market, then basically since the New Deal, the courts have allowed Congress a relatively free hand in regulating that commerce. What's unprecedented about Obamacare is that if you're a 25-year-old kid in good health and you just want to sit on your couch and play video games and you don't want to buy health insurance, this federal law forces you to, either you have to buy insurance or you're fined when you haven't done anything, you're just passive. That's a new and unprecedented thing. That's the, what the plaintiff's second argument should be is, what's the stopping point? If the government can make you do things that it feels are good for you, then why not tell you to buy a car? Why not tell you which kind of house? Why not tell you you have to exercise? Why not tell you what kind of foods you have to eat or can't eat? Now, there doesn't seem to be any stopping point to the theory of the size of government once you allow, uh, under Obamacare, the government to start ordering you to buy health care or do A, B, and C. So, but, Richard, draw the lines for me, for this layman. The government may compel the young person in perfect health to join the armed forces yes. and go off to fight. The draft is yes. perfectly constitutional. Is. The government may compel that young person in perfect health or this older person in so-so health to sit on a jury. You got it. Those I may be compelled cases. to do those two things. Why may the government not compel that person to buy health insurance? Well, what you have to do to understand this argument is to ask what's the rationale that are given behind these two situations. And essentially the basic position is that military defense and jury duty are parts of the duties of citizenship that everybody else has. When you start coming to the situation with respect to the mandate, the way the argument starts to break down is we have to force you in there because of all sorts of economic reasons that bear nothing with your public duties. And the two arguments are somewhat inconsistent. One of them says, well, 
well, we have to make you get insurance because otherwise you'll freeload on the emergency room. But of course, what you could tell them is you can't come to the emergency rooms unless you get yourself insurance. And if you're 25 years of age, it's relatively cheap to get unless you have to subsidize everybody else. So the second argument is we have to drag you in in order to subsidize older people who cannot afford to pay the market rate for the very rich set of benefits that they want. And I think that the third piece, therefore, of the defense, at least within conventional terms, of the, that is, of the attack is to indicate that these two rationales that are put forward for the uh, bill by its defendants are, in fact, mutually inconsistent and highly suspect each in its own right. The correct answer is if people don't want to get health care, that's their choice. They have to take the risk. And if you wish to have a subsidy program, you don't want to put all that burden on the young and the healthy. What you want to do is make it part of general revenues. And we know that when they try to get this thing through as a tax bill, there was so much resistance that they abandoned the effort. Which article of the Constitution prohibits the federal government from engaging in an individual mandate? Well, it's not a question of which one forbids it. You got the question upside down. Yeah. The question is which one authorizes it. Right, the structure of the Constitution. Is, is that, that the way the justices will reason? Well, this is, uh, you know, we don't know. But the okay. answer is that's the argument. That's you the way have you, to should, make. Argue, you and should. And in fact, it's consistent with the text of them and history. Will find that way. Yeah, I there'll think. be at least three justices think that way clearly. Clarence Thomas, Antonin Scalia, and, and Samuel Alito. Alito, I would say. Yeah. Okay. And then you have Kennedy and Roberts. Now, the thing is, Justice Kennedy, who's always that justice in the middle since Justice O'Connor's left. Before Justice O'Connor left, she, he actually was a pretty vigorous proponent of maintaining a balance between the federal government and the state right. governments. On the other hand, he doesn't like to do very unpopular things. He likes this position in the middle of the court. I think that places him in some doubt in a way uh, it didn't maybe 10 years ago. Uh, you mentioned yeah. state uh, balance between the federal government yeah. and the state government. It's in the air. Romney care. If it is impermissible for the federal government to enforce an individual mandate. Is it permissible for the state, the Commonwealth well, of let Massachusetts? Let me return to what Richard was just said. Is that the, it's, you're, it's kind of upside down. And in, in a way, uh, Peter, all the Obama administration arguments have already seeped into your mind, even though you didn't know it. Because I'm gone. It's <laughs> happened. You're lost. I've been you're brainwashed. Lost. You're a lost soul. So, so the, the Constitution, right, is a, its very structure is a, is a limited government. And for the federal government to do anything, you have to find an affirmative grant of power from the people. But notice so the way you asked it is, where in the Constitution does it say we can't do it? Right. This, but that's this is liberalism, the, yeah. right? This is no, liberalism. The, like, well, we assume the government can do it unless something in the Constitution says you can't. That is actually the Constitution I'm, I'm upside down. I'm simply giving voice to Speaker Pelosi, <laughs> no, former no, no, Speaker no, Pelosi. Look, look, <laughs> Stan. So, but, but for the Commonwealth, of, so, so in other words, Mitt Romney has the argument right. That is to say, what we do in the what we did in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is our business no, and has no bearing on the larger constitutional he's half question. Right and I think half Richard wrong. I disagree. Uh, I, I think that yeah. there's a, a kind of complication. Look, the, the first point is things are authorized, meaning powers, and then things prohibited, which are bill of right protection. One of the arguments that you would make against Romney Care as a state matter is why is it consistent with our notion of individual liberty for the state to say, anybody to say under its police powers, you have to subsidize somebody else through health care. And so that would be the individual autonomy argument as opposed to the commerce cause argument. And the truth of the matter is actually it sounds easier to most people because if they're worried about the things that John talked about, dragooning, why would it be so wonderful for a state government to say for somebody who wants to sit home and watch, you know, watch sports and eat potato chips? that you have to subsidize everybody else. But what is interesting is federalism arguments seem to resonate to this court. Individual liberty arguments do not. So the whole individual liberty the argument problem. is done through the If Congress all court. nine seats became vacant at once yeah, exactly. and we named you to the court. <laughs> oh, God. Help us. The individual <laughs> liberty argument would resonate with you. Well, they both resonate with me. Look, one okay. of the things I just mentioned briefly, and I think John knows this, is that the entire New Deal structure of the Commerce Clause, which says that if you feed your grain to your cows, you're engaged in interstate commerce, is a complete perversion of the original organization, which said that the Commerce Clause went to deal with cross-border transactions. Right. So the Epstein U Supreme Court would try to get back to the earlier reading on both the Commerce Clause, which means narrow it, and the individual liberty rights, which would mean to broaden it, which means that we get at this point, what, zero votes in the I, Senate? Yeah, but I would say that if there were nine Richard Epsteins on the court, it would still break out five to four on a lot of issues. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Hold on. I'm a man of two minds, on, yes, on, but not on many point. issues. <laughs> on the individual mandate, only on that issue, how will the court rule? That's tough. I think there's four certain votes to mm -hmm. uphold it. 
the four the four Democrat appoint justices. There's no wavering, no indication at all that they would break ranks on this. So side. what you have to do is the other five, and I think you have Thomas is for certain the most. He's already pretty much said in his early opinions anything like Obama or care would be unconstitutional. And I think you have Alito, and I think you have Scalia. Although some people doubt maybe that Scalia would go this way because. <laughs> Uh, Larry Silberman, for whom yes. I clerked, upheld the Obamacare statute in the yes. lower court. What on earth? And well, many people think, which I think is true, that Silberman and Scalia see a lot of issues very similarly. There is, yeah. I still think Scalia won't jump ship on this. So then uh, it's really up Chief to Kennedy. Justice, the Chief Justice. I think Roberts, if Kennedy's going to go and strike it down, I think Roberts would, would go too. too. But he won't I go alone. If Kennedy upheld the law, I could see Roberts going with the majority to control who got to write the opinion and try to keep it as narrow as possible because Roberts cares about the institutional uh, mm -hmm. permanence of the court and protecting it from politics. Yeah, but, I mean, the vulnerability here, quite simply, is this. There have been a number of conservative judges who've defected to the it's okay view, and there have been no including lower... Including? Including Larry Silverman. Larry. And, and his opinion, he's a lower court judge. Yeah, he says, I, previous opinions are so broad in what Congress is allowed to do, I can't... I can, no. only, I can only defer to the President well, of the United no, States. No, no, right? And he, the Supreme Court. No, he said he said to the Supreme Court of 1938. Yeah, you guys, if they're gonna, <laughs> somebody's going to have to pull the bomb or to get the pin out of the grenade. It's going to have to be the Supreme Court. Yeah. But the, the way the opinion reads, there's too much relish in the decision that he takes. And, and so it's not a very well-reasoned opinion. In, in, just, in, in Judge the Silberman, Silberman opinion. Mm. I actually wrote something uh, which indicated that I thought that this was not reluctant duty, but a sort of an unseemly enthusiasm with respect to what I think is intellectually an indefensible result. All right. Segment two, Obamacare and the trouble with Medicaid. The second Broadly speaking, the second large constitutional issue that Obamacare raises, may Washington, D.C. use federal grants to coerce the 50 states? Now, this layman has struggled to come up with a clear expression of this issue, and I think I've got it, but I put it to the two of you. Well, I Hold just... on. Let me, give, let, me, let, me, let me lay it out first. I mean, a, a preemptive rewriting of, okay. Under Obamacare, states have a choice. They might either cooperate with the new law, and that would require them to expand their Medicaid roles. Uh, Medicaid, of course, is the program for poorer Americans, in which the federal government and the states share the costs. Or they may keep their roles as they now stand, but find themselves forced to continue to pay into the Medicaid program while receiving no further money from Washington. Correct? Did I get it Close right? Close enough for government work, as we say. <laughs> uh, it's a little more complicated. One of the other provisions in there says that with respect to your existing recipients, you cannot cut back on the levels that they already receive. And the question is how you do this. And it's a very difficult topic. And then just for full disclosure, I just finished submitting a brief on this topic earlier this week, um, trying to argue that it was unconstitutional. Submitting a brief to? Uh, to the United States Supreme Court Thank on the you. Title II issue. Uh, the, the basic, they could read your document or just watch the show. Yeah, and it's easier on the show. Let's just put some numbers so I think you could see what the danger is. Right now, California basically pays or receives about $25 billion in Medicaid support from the United States government. $25 billion coming, coming into in. the state from Washington. From Washington. This is a state which is in a very precarious financial position, can't fund its is other it operations. Is it ever? What the choices that they get are is you want to keep your current program and, you know, we really are going to put pressure on you to maintain it. Uh, you're going to have to give up all $25 billion. Or the alternative is what you can do is you can say um, that uh, you're going to keep the money, but if you want to keep the money, you're going to have to spend 10 or $12 billion down the road in order to maintain it. What makes this so hard to challenge is the precise financial estimates of what the net burdens on the states are going to be is very difficult because you're shooting after a moving target, and the Supreme Court is reluctant to go after things unless they're absolutely set in stone. Hold yeah. on. Okay, I think so that argument's a loser, unfortunately. I mean, if you were to go back to the original Constitution... Oh, it's a slam dunk It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's probably winner. pretty clear that... The federal government couldn't bribe states to do things that the states didn't want to do. But ever since the New Deal, but, but even the, under the Rehnquist Court, the Supreme Court has really had an almost impossible time trying to figure out a way to police the spending okay. clause. Okay, so, okay. Richard, but, Richard, hold on. Lay, layman's pessimist. questions, yeah. layman's question, layman's question, following on from John. <laughs> I'm pessimist. Until it was, the law was repealed in 1995, from 1970-something, yeah. I can't remember yeah. the date, until 1995, there was a national speed limit. Yes. And the state of Kentucky or the state of Illinois or the state of California didn't have to impose the national speed limit. But if it didn't, 
it would lose highway funds you know, from you, the federal you, government. You're missing the answer. So what's the, what's the difference? Let me explain to you what the differences are. Uh, with respect to the National Highway Program, it was, in fact, those are the easy cases. We're giving you money, and if we give you money, we can condition on the way that the money we give you will be spent. And these are being spent on public highways. The serious case was a case called South Dakota v. Dole, in which the issue was in 1987, whether when we take away five, we, whether we can take away 5% of your highway money if you do not enact a 21-year drinking limit inside the entire state, wholly unrelated to the highway operation. And the court said that this was okay. Justice Brennan dissented because he said if you look at the 21st Amendment, it removes from the federal government all control over the intoxicating liquors inside Wait, the state. This is, this is Chief Justice Rehnquist yes, wrote the majority yeah, opinion. But, Mr. Uh, yeah. Federalism of his uh, but, day, but, but, but he was the, not willing no, to but Justice, try to okay. separate the, the money too, from the conditions. John is, I think, is too pessimistic on this. Uh, the dissent, I, I wish that the court uh, but was going to go But let me direction. make the argument um, because it's, it's close to having okay, just good. gone through this. The First of all, the dissent was written by uh, Justice O'Connor, strong dissent, and she. the federalism limits came back. What, was the, what, what were the numbers on the decision? It was 5-4? No, it was 6-2-1. Six, six, yes, um, the one was Brennan, and then Scalia, I think, concurred with O'Connor, but somebody occurred with O'Connor. The other point is that the earlier decisions from the 1930s with respect to the spending power in Butler, yeah, in fact, have never been overruled. And what they said was that you cannot use the various manipulations under the Agricultural Adjustment Act to force the regulation of production at a time prior to Wickett and Philbin where there was no direct power to but, do so. Yeah, the problem is that you're quite right, but those taxing spend cases were the pre-New Deal shift on the court back when I think well, and you think the court was being fairly principled but about federalism never, before FDR packed the court or threatened to pack the court and the court but, caved. But, After that, the court no, never but, struck down a spending Well, I mean, they've never done condition. it. They've it's, never done it. So, not I mean, once. Look, not, not once. Seven decades. Time. John is there right about There challenges. It, but they've never had challenges. one like this. They've never had a brief from Richard. Uh, no, but, the, I mean, and this is why the, the, the point <laughs> no, about actually, this... No, they've had lots of briefs from Richard. Richard. They just never win. listen. <laughs> no, they do win on some of them. We're not completely hopeless. But I, I want to put the point more forcefully is that if, no matter which of these two options you take, um, it is very clear that you could have complete disruption of state operations. And what the state has, what the, what the court has done in two 1990s cases, one called Prince and, and one called New York, New York State, it is said that the federal government cannot commandeer state officials to do the bidding of the federal government. These were not standing clause cases, so John would do it. But now I'm just going to give you the difference. What we say to the New York State is, you don't have to take title to these wastes. We're not going to order you, but if you don't take title to it, the $3 billion that we've given to you to aid your nuclear development plans will be withdrawn. How much of a difference is there between these two cases? So it's so this, this is, But let me just say, the reason why the, the arguments, and as you said, the, mm -hmm. the restrictions on the Commerce Clause have resonated so much mm -hmm. is because in the last 10, 15 years, that's where all the action has been. But the, the Supreme Court has, with slender majorities, struck some federal laws down is beyond the Commerce Clause, including the cases you just mentioned. Those are both Commerce Clause no, well, cases. It's the, it's the spending... Do I mean, as an original matter, the original matter of the Constitution, the spending arguments you're making might even be stronger, but under the case law, conservative and liberal justices have shown very little but I interest think, in, no, I, in I, resurrecting... Why, 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 why no, are the conservative uh, justices? Why well, hasn't anybody? Why is it Rehnquist no, who's I'm, writing I'm, that door? Uh, because I, essentially they don't want to get themselves into the position where they think that every single spending program that we yeah, have too, is going to be turned down. So, it, it would be so be. intrusive that's into what the they think. operations of the federal we, government we spend they don't want to review every single spending But they don't have to. I mean, one of the things we did in the briefs that I wrote, which John did not have the benefit of reading before the show, right? Um, was to go through all the programs that are completely unproblematic under this view that we've taken and to indicate the consequences that will flow in this case. There is no doubt that the, if anything, the Supreme Court is more sensitive about the way in which the federal government interacts with the states than it is with the way the federal government interacts with the sort of ordinary oh, people. So and you're so, arguing that this is just like them sticking a little toe into the water, and none, if you strike down Obamacare, no, no, this, is not, the only, this is the one ticket, well, the, one it, trip it, only no, kind of no, thing. No, it's not that. It's not going to strike down all no, these no, other no, spending No, 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 but you cases. could explain why. I mean, you know, you take the... You can fence uh, off Obamacare only under in your... Well, I mean, yeah, I, uh, not, see, not... I think this conservative no. justices, they're always worried about being the super legislature. But they often say that we don't want to be super 
problem. Right. I mean, what you do is, you know, look, okay. this question of conditioning grants has existed in private law with common carriers. It's existed in the antitrust law. And it turns out that you draw very intelligible lines if you're willing to do so. And this is a case in which you're not telling them how to spend the money that we give you for things that both of us agree is a shared purpose. How, We're telling you you how, can't run an education Richard, program. If Richard were to win on that, on that issue, which I don't expect you to, but if you did, that would be the way more serious blow to federal power than the Commerce Clause issue, because the way yeah. the federal government really gets its way in this country now is through money. bribing the states to do things for it. Think about education, yeah. a lot of environmental law, all of the welfare programs are all done under the spending So clause. what you're saying is that if Obamacare is struck down on the individual mandate, we open a bottle of champagne. If it's struck down on Richard's argument, we open a magnum of champagne. <laughs> right. is that, okay, now let me right. ask final That's question right. in this segment. How do arguments before the court work? If you're the plaintiff, do you throw everything at Obamacare that you can? Do you make both of these arguments? Do you choose one? Oh, do you, no, they, do they, you no, indicate no, that your emphasis no, is What do you do? Peter, you, you just throw no, everything no, at no, it that no, you can. No, no, but the court's going to no, do Peter, what it's no, going to do. They're two one. separate days. Yeah. You argue the mandate on one day, Medicaid on another day. It's not the same. The court argument. will permit that. The, they, they've ordered well, multiple. It. Days oh, they have. So, so it's the, amazing. Oh, okay. so, so multiple you, days of argument. Four. There are four separate arguments. I thought it was un extremely unusual to go from one hour to two hours. No, no, no there's six hours. Days. Six <laughs> hours. So this yeah. is really but extraordinary. But look, we've yes. not even I, talked I about two other issues that you have not mentioned, which are the injunction act issue and the 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 severance issues. Okay, stop there. Segment three: the two issues we haven't gotten to yet. Richard, I have no questions on this because I don't understand them. Name the issues. Well, severance is if you take down either the individual mandate or the Medicaid provision, what part of the bills go with it? And it's a very complicated set of doctrines because what the Supreme Court seems to require from its existing cases is that if a part of the bill can be independent, that's an argument against severance. But if it turns out that the passage of that independent thing was done on condition that this other thing was done, so that these two things were perceived by Congress as mutually dependent, yeah, the so the one goes, yeah. the other goes. Obamacare was 2,000 pages yeah. long. Yes. And the court is saying, wait a minute, strike down pages 7 to 13, no. 1,100 to no. 1,120. Yeah, the rest of it survive. Right. right. Yeah, so think so of it like that, that game where you have a whole bunch of sticks and you're yeah, trying to pull, pull yeah. out that the house falling. Now, yeah. on the individual mandate, though, I think... The individual mandate is central to the whole idea of Obamacare because Richard was describing earlier the theory of it is uh, if you don't correct for the free rider problem, people getting free health care, right. you can't contain apart. the you know the costs and yeah. the benefits don't align. So the Obama, the theory of it is that everyone has to be paying into the same insurance pool. The whole country is one gigantic health insurance pool under Obamacare. So if you were to excise, you know, 25 to 28 year olds who just don't feel like paying for it. You know that could blow a huge hole in the whole uh, in the whole scheme of Obamacare. So, 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 so yes. what, what, what does that? How does that, so that impact suggests, the severance argument? Yeah, so that suggests that the whole statute would have no, to no, be it does not out. suggest that because you have to read the whole statute. So, uh, so the frame of mind of the nine justices is well, I think you'd probably argue that four justices are going to say we're for this thing, yeah. don't bother mm -hmm. us. So you're arguing for five, and the frame of mind of those five justices is we're going to try to strike down as little of this as we yeah, can. I, think, no, I no. think with Roberts as the chief justice, his instinct will be, I mean, he doesn't want confrontation between the branches. And he said he's trying to get the court to be less controversial in our politics. So the, the restrained thing to do from a political perspective, not from the judicial perspective, the judicial perspective, I think it's kind of intrusive to decide what Congress would pass or not pass no, and try to recreate hard. it. I mean, you have well, to but read, I think John, but I think John you've Rob, not read the whole statute, have you? <laughs> I did. No, I haven't. No, I don't uh, want to read the whole no, statute. You've read all 2,000 pages? Well, let me explain to you. I mean, I actually, I've read like no, 500 pages. No, no, no. But let I me explain to you. What no, happened? No, wait, 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 let John just finish But politically, point. Roberts, for political reasons, for Roberts' instinct will be to sever the unconstitutional parts and, and to let leave the rest, the rest yes, because, because that's so, less confrontational no, but, to the but you, you, Congress you, and the you president. You gave the pages and the so forth. Let right, me just right, give right. you an actual issue. There is something in the Obamacare Act known as the BPCIA, which has to do with biosimilar drugs, trade secrets, and patents. And it's an area in which I happen to have a misguided expertise. Could I just pause <laughs> to point out, right. for all Americans watching, 
that that issue in itself is immensely complicated. There is not a member of Congress who voted in favor of this thing who read that, let alone understands that sure. one issue but of hundreds that are involved sure. in this. But this is, okay. a, this is an issue which Certainly. is worth hundreds yeah. of billions of dollars because it's a very complicated market, right. but it's perfectly severable. Uh, the point that you have to do is it's relatively simple to say. Title I is the mandate and the general regulation of the private market. Title II is Medicaid. If the individual mandate goes, John is surely right that Title I disappears because you can't balance the accounts, run the exchanges, or do anything. It also turns out, as we showed in our brief, I wrote a brief on this one as well, that the connections between Title I and Title II is so intimate that the two of those will start to go. But the rest of the statute could remain. So the key point here is to not do what you try to do, is to go little bit by little bit by little bit. But go by the titles, say one and two are gone, everything else, all your reporting requirements and so forth, survive. So that's your argument. That's you're arguing your brief is for the plaintiffs. If you're the government, you're trying to suggest to the court, touch this thing, and you have to strike it. Well, we haven't out. seen their brief. Is that briefs what yet. they're trying to? Is they that haven't what? done it. They haven't said yet. But they, I would think politically, they'll do that because politically, that's that raises the costs to the court of what you it wants do to this do. And you're, you're and you are precipitating a constitutional crisis the, exactly. that, that will make the Watergate so, tapes crisis look like a... No, so but strangely, I think the plaintiffs actually would ought to be more interested in having a severable law and the government is saying, well, you really want to roll the dice, the, roll the dice and no, just say you way, have to strike that's, the that's whole the way thing way down. So, we, Richard, but, you said there are two issues that I hadn't named. What's the other the one? The other one is the Anti-Injunction Act, and there is a very complicated... Okay, boys, a little miniature uh, legal uh, This is a New Deal me. lecture from statute from 1937 okay. or so. In say which it again. The, 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 it's the Anti-Injunction Act, and what right. it says, in effect, is that you cannot challenge a law if it is a tax under those circumstances before the actual money has been not only paid but paid and booked. So the whole theory was to try to defer the challenge to tax legislation until the money had been spent so as to reduce the odds that anybody would be able to get an effective the basic challenge. The idea is that if you want to challenge a constitutionality of a tax, and the bill has a lot yeah. of taxes in it, you have to wait till you actually have to pay the tax. You have to you know, refuse to pay it. This or, is the standing. This yeah, is yeah this is kind question. of like, yeah, it's basically merged standing. into standing. So because the idea was you don't want Taxpayers just running around challenging taxes well, preemptively I do. I do. <laughs> before yes. before they three you know, of us would be <laughs> right. happy for but, but before they're levied and you actually have to pay them. So uh, the, the idea was you have to pay them first and then or refuse and then you get to so challenge the court the would have to overturn this New Deal. Doctrine, no, no, no. The question just, it just means that the case is premature. It, it, I, and that's no, actually no. originally I was worried about this issue. Was that no, I don't think this is not work. the right set of plaintiffs. Uh, I would prefer that the people bringing the suit was the 26 year old healthy kid. Who doesn't want to buy well, health there insurance? Is one, but and this, instead, we've got it working yeah, at businesses, it's states' attorney yeah. generals, aren't states' they attorney the generals, and some businesses. Although the the state, lead plaintiff Medicaid. just the yeah. state, look declare but, bankruptcy. The, the Medicaid stuff, which I've worked on, is in, is basically states only. Um, really, they may I, they may even be a private plaintiff, but it doesn't matter. I, at least. The individual mandate is sort of everybody coming in simultaneously. And the whole problem here is we the big battle, as John mentioned, what counts as a tax. And the argument was that this was a penalty, not a tax. If it's a penalty for one purpose, it's a We're penalty for the seven hundred and fifty dollars you pay into if you the don't thing. go and get it, the health care. Okay. And if insurance. it's a penalty, then the anti injunction act would not apply to it. So this is going to be a fairly big technical issue. And and what could it's who knows? one of the possible outcomes is the court could try to escape the political confrontation because either way it decides, mm. one thing knows, either way it decides it's going to mm. be a political Struggle. controversy. They could just say we're going to kick it all out and wait for a better case. Well, and, I don't. Yeah, but, but why would they have accepted it? Why would they have accepted if? if well, they were because you, do that? one of the lower courts struck the law well, down. So usually, no whenever a oh. lower court invalidates so the law, that forced their hand. They usually it's, always grant cert. But no, in those but, kinds no but it's cases. more complicated mm -hmm. even than that because nobody down below has struck down the Medicaid portion that right. John referred yeah. to. And what happened is when they filed for certiorari on the individual mandate, the Supreme Court, on its own initiative, told Texas and Florida and the other twenty-four mm -hmm. states. Mm -hmm. File on this one. We want to hear this as well, and you know, which is weird, yeah, because the lower court cases are all about the and, individual I, mandate. Can the do, government make you, John? I'll tell you what gives me. Yeah, hope. I've read those. I, you read yeah. those cases, and the yeah. opinions are dreadful in terms of their intellectual. The lower court. court. Yes, I the mean, the judges are. This is. Yeah, I mean, the, so both sides. You mean no, either no, outcome? Well, no, no. The, they come out on both. No, sides. no, not on the. I'm talking about on the Medicaid. Oh, part. on the Medicaid. Oh, um, it's uniform because it's complacent, and, and so they said, well, look, this is perfectly constitutional because we give you three years in which you could plan for this. 
What they really are telling you, there's nothing you could do in those three years, but since you have three years to be tortured, uh, it's perfectly constitutional because we gave you notice. So if you actually go through the arguments in the 11th Circuit, one is worse than the other. And so part of the way in which I think that we sort of maintain our challenge is to say, look, here are the rationales that were given under Dole and the other cases, and none of them are any good. And since the Supreme Court asked for it, I just don't believe that it's as hopeless as John thinks it is. There's no question everything is an uphill battle because you got four votes against Last you. Last question on Obamacare. I'd yeah. like to touch on it. it, it it's, it's simply an amazing term. The court has other, other issues that Not would really. be gigantic <laughs> if we, uh, in the absence of Obamacare. Yeah. Just as a layman, what should I be watching for and what do you expect to happen? I think a big issue is Im immigration. No, no, excuse me. I'm in, on Obamacare. Obamacare. Oh, on Obamacare. Obamacare. We'll come to immigration next, right? Oh, um, well, I think the individual mandate issue is the main one. And one thing to ask is, was the Obama administration wise or foolish to seek an accelerated review of the case? What the Obama administration did was essentially push the case forward before the November elections. It could have delayed the case till after the November elections. And so I think the Obama administration took a big gamble. I think they're thinking if the court strikes down Obamacare, this hands him a great political issue, goes back to your first question of the show. Right. And if it's upheld, then Obama can say all these people attacking it for the last year or two years are all extremists, and the Supreme Court agrees with him. And well, your prediction that, is you can't make a prediction. No, I mean, if I, if, so I had to, if I had to bet real money, I, I, would say the court will, I would say the court will strike it down. This is for your first question, but then I think that will really help Obama I don't in, the, help in Obama. the campaign. It will energize people. Well, will be I mean, it will energize his base, for Richard, sure. You know, having your been prediction. so involved in this thing as a, as a litigant, it's very hard to keep some distance. What I would watch for is the level of hostility and curiosity in the oral arguments. Uh, these cases so big that these people will start to tip their hands and you will get fairly good information as to what the sentiments are from the individual justices. So we watch and Justice Kennedy's questions. You, and, we watch and, and body, body language. language. You got it, the whole thing. On that chamber, you, what takes place uh, in that uh, chamber? On the other hand, I bet that they will already made up their minds before no, I, they hear I don't argument. believe that I, because I think they're yeah. going to be always jousting That's one way or another. There'll be so much pressure information coming in afterwards. My sense is that I think it's very hard to win a case when you're running against the government. Uh, my, the, the, the central challenge is can you get them to overcome their presumption of quiescence? And I think the reason that John may be right, and I may even be right on Medicaid, is... is <laughs> odd, 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 odd word to use in relation to Scalia, yeah, and Scalia yeah, but I'm sure... Yeah, it would but work. I mean, the general <laughs> deference to legislation sure. is what I mean. Um, I think, in fact, that there's a deep public awareness of uh, that this thing is not supported by a majority of the population. Actually, that's one other thing to keep an eye out for. And I, I think that makes a difference. It's the job? political opinion, the opinion polls about uh, Obamacare, because uh, if the court, it's usually, it's interesting, if the court strikes down a law, usually it's acting in what we call the counter-majoritarian yeah. way. It's opposing the majority, and that's hard for a court to do. But the interesting thing about Obamacare is that the opposition is now uh, the so popular, the, the majority of the country wants at least the individual yeah. mandate repealed. So they the don't court can actually medication. strike down the law, and they're going to be shielded from political attack by the majority. The, okay. so, next, but the next, polls are fluctuating, uh, so next, it depends what they'll be. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, final word. Look, I mean, th this whole kind of interactive word, poll, not for <laughs> I don't want um, I don't want to push it very, very hard, but the, the whole sentiment with respect to this statute is going to be one of relief if you strike it down, because the budgetary... In the nation. In the nation, because these regulations are coming out now. Even uh, the administration wants uh, to bury uh, uh, this thing if it could. Uh, but you no, you did... No, but there's a well, notion. I, I wrote they... a paper of something called uh, "Government by Wave." Hold on, no, that's coming. I'm coming to that. That I have a question for. Okay, but you're not I... allowed to start that yet. <laughs> okay, but the point is, the administration is already backing off on its enforcement before it's enforced. Okay, that's, true. that's Obamacare segment four. Other issues that at least strike this layman as great big <laughs> issues: mm -hmm. the Arizona immigration case, signed into law by Governor Jan Brewer on April 23rd, 2010. Arizona Support Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhoods Act. Why did the constitutional framers leave out a provision requiring states and Congress to name legislation in two words or fewer? <laughs> the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Right. Support right. Our Law Enforcement and Safe Neighborhoods Act was the first of its kind. The law requires local police to check the citizenship status of people stopped for questioning. The law also makes it a crime under state law for illegal immigrants to work or to fail to register under a federal law already on the books. Five other states now have similar statutes, total of six. Paul Clement, the attorney representing Arizona before the Supreme Court, quote, 
the burdens on the federal government to explain why the burden is on the federal government to explain why immigration is sufficiently different from every other area of the law that a state may not be permitted to enforce the federal law. Close quote. I think he's wrong. Why? Well, a, a, first of all, if it is not different, the general rule is preemption. That is, mm -hmm. where in an area in which the federal government has admitted authority, if the state does something that the federal government doesn't want to do, then the state has to back off. In this particular case, it's not just a question of looking at this thing from the question of what the statute says and what the state statute says. This is a case where the federal officials who are enforcing the statutes are opposed to the Arizona law. But they're not enforcing yes, the statutes. From no, the no, point no, of view no, of the no, state, no, 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 the, the, here's the law that's on the, no, no, the federal no, the, laws on the books, the federal government is not enforcing its own laws. No, no, what they it's unconstitutional said, no, no, for us no, no, to help no, no, out. Yeah. Because we have told them we don't want their help. John, and what so Lola no, gets. I think Richard is, this is interesting. Richard, you're giving the argument for broad federal power here. No, is, a preemption. <laughs> yeah, broad preemption. federal power, which I, I actually think here, it's, it's in a way, it's the same structural issue as Obamacare. It's the balance of power between the federal government and the state government. Here's a case where the states are trying to implement a policy of their own that tries to add on to federal policy. You know, the state's not trying to change the definition mm -hmm. of an illegal alien. It's already, as you said, illegal for an illegal alien to work in the country without a very valid social security number and so on. So what the state is trying to do is uh, enforce federal law because it feels the federal government is lax. Right. Is not enforcing. Now, right. Richard says there, there are some cases that go this way that uh, in the foreign affairs context especially, it's saying yeah. even the choice of how much enforcement to, is a federal policy choice. On the other hand, there are other cases that say, right, if state law incorporates federal law as a standard, you, the states have some leeway to enforce it. There have been previous cases even in the immigration context. So, again, there's a conflict uh, of two competing visions no, of the I, I Constitution. Think, and what do you predict? I actually think the court will uphold the state immigration I law. I think they'll strike it down. I'm pretty clear. Uh, there's a case called Heinz and Dravidowitz. <laughs> terrific. Um, <laughs> what a good you are to injure it. <laughs> this, this, this issue actually came up during the Second World War. And it was quite clear that when the federal government spoke administratively, it cut state stuff down administratively. That is, in these preemption cases, whether you like it or not, first of all, there's no doubting the federal power over this issue. It's very right, clear. If the federal government passed a law, no, it's they not, could prohibit the no, states from No, 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 it's not that. If the they, question, but if they did that, they could. They could. There's this no, is doubt, not, about there's no that. doubt about that. But that's not what the issue is. The issue is, under these circumstances, whether it's administrative versus administrative, so it's not private tort actions and so forth. The Supreme Court's attitude on preemption is very clear uh, that on administrative stuff, the federal administrators get to call the tune. And if they announce as administrators they don't want this state assistance, that is going to end it. So okay. I don't think that there's much of a chance I'd, of like to get being through, I'd like to get through another two cases okay. very brief, very briefly. Okay. Affirmative action. Abigail Fisher is a white woman whose application to the University of Texas was rejected. The University of Texas, public institution in the state, of course, this stuff is all publicly known, combines racial preferences with a rule that guarantees admission to Texans who graduate in the top 10 percent of their high school classes. Fisher's appeal has asked the Supreme Court to consider the 2000 three ruling, Gr Grutter, Gruder, Gruder, how is that pronounced? Gruder versus Gruder, Ball. Gruder, which upheld the use of race as a factor mm. for purposes of classroom diversity. You're allowed to use race as a factor in admissions if you're doing so for educational purposes under Gruder. This is, a, the, this is interesting because this would be the biggest issue where the replacement of O'Connor with Justice right. Alito would is make a big difference, difference. because O'Connor was the fifth vote to uphold uh, yeah. in the Michigan cases, Gruder and Gratz versus Bollinger, the use of race as a factor on, I thought, very specious reasoning, which was you need to have ideological diversity in the classroom. So, and this is a non sequitur, therefore you should be able to use race because they'll add yeah. diver ideological diversity in the classroom. The insulting thing as a, you know, as a minority, racial minority, is that that assumes people of a race have yeah. a specific viewpoint, because otherwise, why can't you assume everyone that You by yourself <laughs> throw that <laughs> argument. Yeah, but John, I'm Peter. But so, I, so, so I think that this case, I could, if Alito, you know, Alito, at least in the lower courts, as I understand it, um, was pretty tough on these kinds of government schemes to use race. The other four justices are on record uh, opposing the use of race. They struck, actually just a few years after Gruder, Gruder. they struck down the use of race in K through 12 uh, busing programs in Seattle. 
Uh, Roberts wrote a very strong opinion yes. uh, in that case. So, and Kennedy has always been pretty good on this, also. Well, so, pretty bad. I, see, I'm on the other but, side but, of this issue. Hold on, but, but I think that. So, I think the court will strike it down because. You know, when we exchanged emails <laughs> yesterday, you said, "Oh, this could be a dull show because no, John and I will agree on everything." No, no, no. I, so, I, I, okay. So, go ahead. Let me explain. See, uh, but, but Richard's Richard has a, a no, very I, big I, defect I, on this issue. So no, no, he no, served John, as I, an interim I, dean at the University of Chicago Law School. Yeah, you're a professional academic. So he became an administrator. You were an administrator. It's, it's not a defect. It's actually it's a reality check. The, the, <laughs> the okay. fundamental distinction, as far as I'm concerned, in constitutional law has been neglected thus far. And that's the distinction when the government, as a regulator, imposes its preferences on other people. So mandating affirmative action in private schools would be a mistake. And on the other hand, when it actually has to run an institution like I have done. And what Justice O'Connor said, which won the case, had nothing to do with a rather shabby legal argument. She said, I got letters from the admirals. I get letters from the CEOs. I get letters from everybody and anybody who's in this business. You put me into a colorblind situation. I cannot run my institution. And she is right about that. It is just... She's right. She got letters. No, no, I think no, all those no, 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 I mean, no, 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 John, <laughs> John, having been there, having seen all this stuff, having run an affirmative action program, essentially the the way in which you deal with this issue responsibly is not to create what would be an absolute outburst. Because remember, the anti- You're wrong, and here's why. No. Because of the, whatever the prop was, you remind me, John, yeah. that made it illegal in the state of California yeah. to use race as a factor, and the, the University of California- No. Screamed and hollered, and, and within about 20 seconds, they have said, "Okay, we're not going to use race. No, we'll look at economic were, status. No, we'll look at there's they, been a lot of there's, there's controversy plenty of diversity in UC, but, but, but they, they do all sorts of other right? kind of but, things. But it's going to be much more difficult. I'd rather do it correctly because with the Texas system, for example, the 10 percent stuff okay. is a racket. Um, because what you're doing is you're trying to but get these people but into it's still places. A race neutral, uh, rule. but it's a race neutral stupid rule as opposed to a race neutral <laughs> smart rule. Okay. But, Last case, censorship. Oh. Fox and ABC, Fox News and ABC, are asking the court to overturn decades-old rulings that give the Federal Communications Commission more authority to regulate programming on broadcast stations than on, than on cable or satellite. Fact set. Well, Here's a quotation. Oh, no. Judge Robert Bork, quote, Sooner or later, censorship is going to have to be considered as popular culture continues plunging to ever more sickening lows. From the earliest colonies on this continent over 300 years ago and for the first 175 years of our existence as a nation, we endorsed and lived with censorship. Close quote. John. No, well, let me say, regardless of what Judge Bork says there, uh, the reasoning that the court has used in the past to uphold to censorship okay. is just the time has passed it by. Because and, and no one actually makes the argument. Bork, at least Bork's trying to be an originalist. He's saying censorship for obscenity reasons is okay because two hundred years ago well, in the Constitution. He's, I mean, that quote, I plucked pluck that quotation right. because that's the right. argument is a free speech argument. Right. But, that the, the but the court, right. yeah, but the court's doctrine that's upheld these restrictions. I mean, those dirty words during prime time. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with the original frame. It has to do with this. Uh, really antiquated theory that because there's a limited spectrum Bandwidth, and the government right, right. is in charge, owns it, and is giving it almost like some kind of public utility to the networks, they get to make sure. But in a world where you have thousands of channels on the Internet and cable, it's possible. It doesn't make any sense anymore. It's not this scarce resource that the government and has the to parcel And the have changed so utterly. So I think that that, is, I mean, there's because not, so the, of technological so change, this doctrine no, can't. No, so no, you do agree on no, this one. No, no. I mean, I, you, you, you remember when they I came, still like to be channels without a lot yeah, of cursing yeah, and you, channels without you too yeah, and, and you Bono on that. it, too. You could watch it. People will provide it privately. If you remember when... Yeah. When Gone with the Wind came out. The family channel. The, yeah, when family Gone channel. with the Wind came out, the censor said, frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn, was a line that they had to get rid of. Richard, we're going to have really? to bleep that from this show. Yeah, absolutely. But the point is, you, also, you, you was, can't even find out why it is. The, the public well, even morals, a, Did you hear there's a great line that uh, Justice mm -hmm. Kagan had yeah. about this, which she was saying, well, ABC got fined for Bono, but they were allowed to show for Saving Private Ryan and yeah. Sh Schindler's List. And so Kagan apparently said... So I guess the only person who's allowed to use obscenity on TV is Steven Spielberg. Yeah. <laughs> but, but it goes to the point that there's this, once you give this kind John, of power John, but, of, you know, you yeah, give uh, all this discretion uh, to administrators. Look, I mean, what yeah. the, the point about this is that the 
government is grantor has greater power than the government is regulator. What our friend Bork wants to do is to kind of flip it over and to say that the power we have as a regulator now goes even when we're not the grantor, it goes into direct regulation. And the thought that the Supreme yeah, Court sure. is going to push in that direction, that's just not going it's to just not going to okay. happen, yeah, nor should right. it happen. Segment five, right. final segment, the rule of law in 2012. Although Obamacare has yet to go into effect fully, the Secretary of State of Health and Human Services has already granted about 2,000 waivers. waivers, exempting from the law entities that range from big labor unions to Waffle House. <laughs> and it may be worth noting that more than three dozen waivers have been granted in the district of former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Boy. who <laughs> rammed the law through. Richard Epstein, quote, though we may take it for granted the rule of law is no easy thing to create and preserve. Government by waiver is perhaps the most serious challenge to the rule of law of our time. Does it follow, John Yu, that Obamacare itself, so vague, so vast, that it all but invites the political class to start carving out exceptions, these waivers, does it follow that Obamacare itself represents in some basic way a challenge to the rule of law? Oh. I don't think it's Obamacare. I think this is a mistake that we have made since the New Deal. Because look at those early New Deals. Obamacare is just the, whatever you call it, the highest culmination of this idea. The original New Deal statutes, Congress would say, you can regulate the airwaves or you can regulate all of agriculture in the public interest. And now you, the administrators, go do it. So I think Obamacare is bad for exactly the reasons Richard points out. But it's no worse than what we started doing in 1934, 1937. It it's clearly no. worse. I because it's when Congress handed all that authority no, John, to John, the agencies. Let, let me the agencies then got all this discretion to start playing favorites. Well, look, and I this mean, is just an extreme version. No, of John it. says the world, the country's been going to hell for 80 years, well, and Richard says that's too optimistic. No, <laughs> my, let me see if I can put my position out there. I, I have certainly opposed very much the kind of public interest, convenience, and necessity statutes because they give you no workable criteria. But those Which date back to, to the New this, Deal. Uh, this right. is the one that I'm quoting for the Federal Communications Act. But these are not waiver statutes. What you do is you have six applicants and you have to pick one. And it turns out there are no criteria to decide, so you get arbitrary and capricious behavior. All right, that's bad. But what we do now without Obamacare is it's not a question of which one gets the gold star. We now have thousands upon thousands of firms that have to comply with an act. And you come forward and say, I ought to be out, but my competitor ought to be in. And your competitor says the reverse. So you mentioned that there were unions who were getting exemptions, Pelosi districts who were getting exemptions and so forth. It turns out somebody actually did an account and blue state people get a lot more exemptions than red state people. What happens here is the select... This is already unambiguously being used as a political yes. lesson. Yes. Right? In a way yeah. in which you, know, you could... They're helping their yeah. friends yeah. Which you your could enemies, never so. do with granting a franchise, you know, to NBC this station or somebody else that station. And, and it's just going to continue. The reason why I think the situation becomes so dangerous is that you never quite know when to stop this. You have parody arguments, they're calling them back arguments, they're factual presentation arguments as to how you make this thing go. So what you do, instead of having a statute to which everybody has to adhere, you essentially have many courts inside the HHS or some other thing which says you yes and you no. So I call this government by waiver because you set an unattainable standard and then you relax it for your friends and you enforce it against your I enemies. I think the mistake was back in the New Deal I when you that gave those powers that become unaccountable to agencies. But this they can is, write but the this rules. Is, if this is worse, then this is distinctively worse. Yes, Something, is, some is, new line has now been It's hard crossed. to put your finger on it. I mean, I take Richard's point there. The thing that makes it worse is that you're doing it individual by individual, on, whereas under the New Deal state, you look, the agencies this, under New Deal state always were helping their friends, the unions hurting their enemies, it, but they did it in rules that seem to be applicable across the country. Doesn't it puzzle you a little bit that people aren't angrier about? I mean, in the old days, how did you get an, ap an apartment in Moscow? Please the party. Well, and that's now, rent control. That's yeah. schmearing. And look, this yeah, it's is kind of like you have to go to the king to get a monopoly yeah. over something. Yeah, no, 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 you look, to the Peter, it has the following yeah. very kind of vicious or ugly side to it. The guy who gets the waiver is not going to protest the process that gave it to him. The guy who's the competitor dare not protest because, A, he wants one, too, and, B, if he embarrasses the agency, not only will he not get a waiver, he'll get clobbered he'll over get the enforcement head. Action. So what, what, what you do, in effect, is you've created this subculture for which there is no judicial review. And there was always judicial review. And under you, are, these kinds you have of created, a, you have blanketed the country with incentives, not merely to please one political party or one ideology, mm -hmm. not just the Democratic Party and not just liberals, 
you have cr blanketed the country with incentives to undermine the the democratic process it's itself. Called the rule of law, as we used to okay. say, the fair right. and neutral application without bias of general principles is no longer sustainable when the set of positive benefits becomes so large that you're requiring people to provide that you know when you pass the, the law, hand, people won't be able to do it. The courts are not going to step in and stop it. Well, I, the, I mean, I just don't see Well, it. that's the problem because yeah, no, no one's going to challenge it. The only people it. could stop it is Congress. Oh, forget that. <laughs> yeah, oh, actually, forget. Okay, so in January, President Obama made recess appointments to the Consumer oh, Financial Protection Bureau and the National Labor Relations Board, even though the Senate was not in mm. recess. Charles Krauthammer, quote, this is a lawless action by the president, the end of a long string of lawless actions. This is banana republic. He's right. Um, well, I, I wouldn't go that far, but uh, oh I mean, yes, but it is a it, it, unbelievably it is an exercise of presidential power that goes beyond anything Bush did. And I, let me explain well, why. Well, this is true. I mean, this no. isn't because, yeah, because you I, are, I, you've I, written yeah. five books so yeah, far on I, presidential I, you know, power. I, Go ahead. I mean, part of, there's two things about it. One is that uh, the, just the claim goes beyond it. But the other thing is the bigger picture is I, I don't like to see presidential power squandered and wasted on such stupid things. I mean, if, if you're going to have a broad vision of presidential power, use it on important things like wartime. But to spend it on trying to gain an advantage in Ohio over who gets to regulate credit cards, it's, just, it's, just, it's, it's, a, I think it's, it's almost like a parody of presidential power. I think it's power. much more important than that. Um, uh, first of all, this is a guy who sits essentially as a sovereign with respect to a huge area. There is no way to reverse any decisions that he makes. And to bypass the Senate confirmation on a process like this, I think, is very dangerous. And there is nothing about the process which limits it to people who are administrators, right? So the NLRB is a judicial body. And what he does, in, in effect, is he makes it in part. The other thing is, if you look at the text, uh, what is to stop the president from saying that it's now a recess, I'm going to appoint Peter Robinson as a member of the United States Supreme Court for another oh, year. Oh, well, then I throw all, all my uh, principles uh, go over the side. Just trying to just throw like the next election. But, but you could imagine, <laughs> but just imagine this. Suppose, you know, there's nothing in the Constitution that limits the Supreme Court to nine justices. Do we really want that there's a vacancy and a bit of political fight for the president to make a one-year appointment, it, went it up has, on the issue? It is has the happened. Okay? It has yeah, happened. Under George Washington, yeah. once. And Warren, actually. He pointed uh, Berger and, uh, not Berger, uh, Warren and, um, I, I'm sorry, Eisenhower pointed Warren and Brennan as recess appointees, actually, in the beginning. If, if he didn't. That should be yes. precedent enough yes. to warn so us all. Pending their confirmation. Pending their confirmation. Yeah, right. but, but the, yeah, but actually, to, to me, actually, the bigger right, threat right. to the separation of powers yeah, from it. what uh, Obama did was that right, in the past, it was up to the Senate to decide how it ran itself. And the Senate would say, we're going to go into adjournment. The question has always been, if you're an adjournment, how many days it has that have to be until there's a recess? A when there's a recess, the president can appoint. This is the first time where the Senate was in session. They had people there saying, we're opening the session, we're closing the session. And the president, for the first time, as far as I know, has said, I get to judge the quality of your proceedings. I don't think you're really meeting or working hard enough, so I'm going to consider it as if you're not meeting at all. And then yeah, I'm yeah. going to. That is a, a serious threat under any vision of separation, perhaps, because one branch is basically judging the quality of the work and the deliberations of the other branches. This as is, if President Obama said, if the Supreme Court strikes down Obamacare, it's as if President Obama said, I don't think you thought hard enough about it. I don't think your opinions are very good, so I'm going to pretend no, that you I didn't mean, even I'm issue a judgment. John Yu, in the Wall Street Journal column, marking the 20th anniversary, of the appointment to the Supreme Court of Justice Clarence Thomas. Thomas. Quote, <clears throat> Justice Thomas thinks that the meaning, of the, con the meaning the Constitution held at its ratification binds the United States as a political community and that decades of precedent must be scraped off the original Constitution like barnacles on a ship's hull. That can't be hull. right. That is some great writing, Richard. No, what are you who, talking about? No, that that hold on, magic? hold on. That's on a scale beautiful. of one to 10. Mm -hmm. One meaning that it will never happen, and ten meaning that it is certain to happen. In our lifetimes, are we likely to see the Supreme Court grope its way back to original, in, uh, not the original, in, original meaning is the phrase. No, it? It, it, we, no. Give me a number. Well, never, give, never, never. It's a one, it's a never, zero. Let me give you two. The oh. first two cases that disappear from view. 
One is Marbury and Madison, and the other is Martin against Hunter Lessee. That is, both of those cases, the one dealing with arguably judicial supremacy, is not found in the Constitution, and the ability for the federal courts to review state determinations. I can determinations. tell from John's face that he'll give the court permission to stop just short of Marbury. <laughs> <laughs> and Mar I mean, well, I John. actually tend to think judicial review was originally understood. So but I don't. I, I, I think that, that's clear. It was, but, but not in the century. But think time. about Richard when when you went to law school yeah. in the 1850s. I'm sorry, the 1950s. No, 60s. 60s, <laughs> 60s, 60s. But, Right, you would have been even more pessimistic then that the court would move in the direction that Peter's asking about. Look how far they've come since 1970s. They have moved in an originalist direction. No. You see citations of the Federalist Papers. Yes. There are things they have struck down as inconsistent with original understanding, throwing out past precedent. It's... You know, it's going to take a long time, no, but, but they are they are doing we things now. Last question. Here's what, I'm, here's what I'm getting you know, at. I disagree again. It's not that you... Sometimes they ought not to do it. Sometimes they should. Strike down Plessy oh, v. Ferguson. Richard, but... but I mean, Brown v. Board is you know, clearly wrong so as an original right matter. I knew I should have... If I let this show run long, Richard would become suspect. I'm not suspect. <laughs> it's just that, in fact, it's a very complicated accommodation that one has to make. Here's, here's what I'm getting at. What? There's, I'm getting at a question that has to do with constitutionalism and in a certain sense, the national psychology. Yeah. Last question, last question. Financial system is still recovering from the crisis of 2008. Slow growth, high yeah. unemployment. Yeah. We borrow 40 cents of every dollar the federal yeah. government spends. Yeah. The Secretary of Defense has just announced that it looks as though we can't afford new aircraft carriers. China's growing, we're not. On and on and on. Yeah. There is a palpable sense that the wheels are wobbly, if not coming well, off the back. whole Absolutely. American project. And so what I want to know from the two of you who have devoted your lives in mm. some pretty fundamental way to the Constitution of the United States is this. Does the Constitution and constitutional law and our system of justice remain a kind of sheet anchor in this republic, or is it in decline itself? Is well, it participating in the larger sense that the wheels are coming off the project? Well, John? It's more like the uh, metaphor I tried to use, I guess unsuccessfully, the USS with Justice Thomas. Right? The USS Constitution. It has become so encrusted with barnacles of precedent and judicial decisions over the years that we, it obscures the original, I think some of the beauties of the original Constitution. And one of them has to do with your exact point was the Constitution was designed to make it hard for the federal government to act in domestic affairs. It was supposed to be difficult for the government to regulate. It was, supposed, it was supposed to give the benefit of the doubt to the private sphere, civil society, to let the economy grow through lack of interference. And what we've had, especially since the New Deal break, and again, I think Obamacare is just the culmination, the worst example of what started in the New Deal period, is that the government, it's, it's as if the bias is reversed in the Constitution. Now, as you asked, we ask, does the Constitution prevent the government from doing anything? No, but it's, it, it's, originally the idea was private people should be able to make the jobs. Do, do you, do you hear, wish. you're teaching law, you're in front of kids, you're a member of the Federalist Society. Do you hear off over the horizon the first shots of the counter-revolution? No. Are no, you? but what gives me some encouragement is that, the, <laughs> I mean, is that a lot of students are becoming more individualistic, dare I say even more libertarian. You maybe see it in the strangely high vote totals that Ron Paul's getting in the primaries. Yeah, but but okay. I think the individuals, because of the freedoms I think we're seeing in the Internet and the new technologies, they're becoming more suspicious of government action than but they used to. But that's all fine, Richard. but the structural issues here are much more profound and much more difficult. Uh, there are basically two things that have happened, neither of which is under the slightest bit of attack today. One is the absolute dominance of government regulation over labor markets on the one hand and real estate and capital markets on the other. And what happens is all of these regulations are completely counterproductive, uh, and what they do is they shrink the productive base of the United States. On top of this, what we have now imposed, and this has long been sanctioned as a massive systems of public redistribution. So to talk about somehow or other that we're going to be able to right this shift when the Medicare thing is going to sail through, if John is correct, is wrong. And we've done both. What we do is we don't produce and we transfer what we do produce. And so one of the reasons why we have this 40 percent deficit or 40 percent of public spending is, in fact, coming right out of the um, debt side is, quite simply, the taxes from the rich 
have disappeared relative to expectations. So tax revenues are down to 15 percent. In the meantime, the government as Mitt Romney has demonstrated, yes. also and so to spend all our money on There is no healthcare. way back. Is that what you're no, telling me? No, I'm not saying no. I don't. I don't say, no, I, I don't, I don't say there's no way view. back. But I think what's you, the way back? The only That's, this is my last question. You have to fundamentally the way back. You have to fundamentally restructure the set of expectations on what governments are supposed to do. How? And I mean, either you win the political debate or you lose everything because it's not going to be the justices. You have to persuade people that if you don't will have growth, you will never survive. If you emphasize inequality as the number one vice, you will How never get How close to the edge are we? Does that have to happen in 2012, or do we have another no, four I, years? No, I don't know how so many just, years, but John, where, you're where gonna, is this is the just, last I don't want to be misunderstood. Argument. I think Peter's right that it is the Constitution that expresses these values. I don't want to be read to say it's the courts that are going to save us, but one of the great things about the Tea Party, I think, is that they are calling for a political recognition, restoration of constitutional values. Including preservation and, of Medicare and Social Security. No, well, I mean, so, 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 people, no, but, so don't go too far down no, that but, road. But I think that's the debate we're having now, and that's a healthy and a good debate, because I do think the Constitution has actually some biases built into it that are favorable to what you want. Well, you you will retire. The three of us will one day be sitting in rocking chairs on mm. oxygen in a home in a country that is more constitutional, truer to the Constitution, then than it is now. Yes, I agree. I False. do believe that. All we right. have gotten wrong. We have gone. That is, with all the talk that John says, the expansion. You're of nothing but talk, John. Um, <laughs> I'm about like Richard. The, about the, you know the, the quotes of the Federalist Papers and all the rest yeah. of it. The scope and, act and pervasive nature of government activity as a percentage of the GDP has gone up since that revolution has taken place. And unless and until there's a fundamental change in attitude, which I don't see happening, we are a nation that is going to go into very steady and consistent Hold decline. On. Oh, so you're, you're done. The you get one sentence. You're, yeah. in which to end this show oh. on an up. Here, we are not Europe. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Richard Epstein <laughs> yes. and John Yu, thank you very much for Uncommon Knowledge. This is Peter Robinson in a pool of sweat. Thank you for joining John, us. John, you're a hopeless optimist. I am.